My name is Allison Warner and I am the Chief Editor of Orthodontic Products. As part of our continuing look at how COVID-19 is affecting the practice, we wanted to take a look at the issue of mitigating and handling aerosols in the clinic area. To do that, we are joined by Dr. Jay Bowman. Dr. Bowman is a diplomat of the American Board of Orthodontics and a member of the Edward H. Engel Society of Orthodontists. He's been a, in private practice for over 30 years. He's an adjunct associate professor at St. Louis University, an assistant clinical professor at Case Western Reserve University, and a visiting clinical lecturer at Seton Hill University. He is a frequent writer and lecturer and is either contributing editor or on the board of a number of publications, including our editorial advisory board. In private practice at Kalamazoo Orthodontics in Michigan, Dr. Bowman is currently working with the AAO COVID-19 Task Force on our subject today. Jay, thank you for joining me today. Oh, it's a, it's a pleasure to see you again, Allison. It's been too long. I know, definitely. We miss, we miss the AAO and probably yeah. gonna miss a bunch of other meetings. Mm -hmm, exactly, yeah. Well, let's get started. What is the status of your practice at this point? Well, in Michigan, we are one of the last of the Midwest uh, states that still are unable to practice uh, except for emergencies. And um, just noted today that Illinois has reopened. So everything around us, uh, don't know about Wisconsin, but all the other states are now permitting um, um, regular appointments for dentistry and orthodontics. So uh, we hope that we are able to start to see our patients June 1st but um, we don't know and we probably aren't going to know until it comes really close to that date. Okay. What are you doing to prepare or what are you implementing ahead of reopening? Since, uh, since the first days of this, we reacted immediately. I, I was the first to, uh, no virtuous signaling with this, we were the first ones to close up hmm. uh, and immediately started to take action. So, uh, we can we can jump into some of these, yeah. these things that we did right away, yeah. but it was a knee jerk reaction. I'll put the emphasis on jerk reaction, <laughs> uh, doing things that uh, seem to be the quickest, simplest, and also uh, expedient in purchasing equipment. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the first thing I did was put up some plastic sneeze guards in the wow. reception area. I had them made locally. Okay before you know now there's obviously commercial versions of these things available mm -hmm. and then uh started you know looked at temp uh thermos uh thermometers i looked at thermostats too because i've <laughs> replaced the heating system but we'll get to that as well um i looked at the uh, the uh different filtration systems that were portable looking for mm -hmm. simple easy fixes and purchased some of those things and also the little uh sort of nail salon r2d2 type looking uh, uh, next to the mouth filtration systems. Um, and it was at that time that then I started to get really serious about this and, and investigate it further. So uh, that's kind of led me to where we are today with the changes that are going on in the practice. Right. Also, um, we immediately began creating a process manual. My staff is really good at doing this, my management crew. Uh, we are, we're followers of what is called uh, the entrepreneurial operating system or the book is called traction and okay. we really follow that closely so we are pretty nimble in our changes that we can make in the practice as a result and so the process manual is taking form of a detailed uh, description of what changes are going to happen not only for staff and patients um, but also the, just the management of all of this mm -hmm. and also, we have uh, another format of that that's being created right now is a PDF. Well, actually, it's a, a PowerPoint that'll be used for training for staff mm. of all the changes and procedures. So um, we had the advantage of working with Jackie Dorst in the past, and you, she's one of your frequent yeah. com contributors, and we, we, we really appreciate all she has taught us. She's been to our office in the past, and uh, I've known her for a long time. So we're following her recommendations and, and thankfully we're able to run what we're doing past her. Mm -hmm. uh, she's really busy and it's tough for her to do that, but it's been kind of her to, to look at what we're attempting to do. Mm -hmm. and also, I've had one other uh, major contributor to what we're doing and, and that's my friend Jason Cope in Orthodox down in oh. Texas. Mm -hmm. And he, it, it really is an advantage if, if you have two people kind of separating, separating the duties of doing in effect Google research, Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, looking not only at scientific papers, but also what is what is the current climate? What is all the stuff that's going on out there and what's available for sale, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So the, we, we run stuff past each other on a daily basis. What are you doing? What are you looking at? And so some of this information is uh, stuff that both of us have come come together with ideas and we're each doing somewhat different things in our practices, but we are making changes. Hmm. Um, how are you expecting your kind of day to day to change in terms of the clinic area? Well, I think the primary thing is reducing the number of patients that we can see. Our capacity is almost cut in half. Okay. Uh, we'll talk in a few minutes about uh, the changeover in what, what we're doing for each area of the clinic and what rooms we have. Uh, but in effect, we're working in pairs of chairs now that are separated. And so one chair will be occupied by a patient with an assistant that um, is being directed by me to do what is necessary, where the second chair has been disinfected and there's nobody in it to maintain social distancing. And there is what we call a scribe. A scribe is one of our staff members who will be the recording assistant. So her job is to enter everything into our uh, management system on the computer, uh, complete orders that might be sent out, prescriptions, um, taking the photographs, clinical photographs, we do a lot of those uh, during the day for almost every patient. Um, and then also we'll be responsible for um, uh, dismissing the patient back up to the clinic or the uh, reception area and out. And then we'll contact the parent who is in their waiting room, which is their car at this point, okay. and we'll be informing them either using uh, telephone, uh, texting, or, um, possibly uh, also video. I think that the uh, options of using things like DoxyMe or Zoom or something of that nature to communicate with patients face-to-face -face that way, at mm -hmm. least through, through the uh, internet, would be a value since they're not going to really be seeing the doctor at appointments, at least mm -hmm. not at the time, because the changeover from PPP, PPE yeah. uh, make it almost impossible to be able to see very many patients. You'd have to be donning and doffing equipment between patients. So uh, it, it just it makes it better for the, the doc to be able to contact, uh, connect with the parent in a uh, video call or chat mm -hmm. after the appointment to explain what went on, what is the progress and answer questions that they might have. So a lot of that may happen with the scribe assistant, but I can also then peek in and, and uh, give, give my two cents as well. Okay. Um, in terms of PPE, um, what are you doing there and how has it been getting supplies? That's been difficult. Um, we donated quite a few of our supplies to the frontline workers uh, the first week or so, yeah. uh, but we do have uh, satellite offices and no one had gone out there. so. We've taken in all of the supplies from the two satellite offices to our main location. We won't be using the satellites for a little while until we get everything handled here, which we have more capacity for. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, we are trying to order things such as gowns and, and masks and such. And uh, it's a challenge, especially mm -hmm. since they've started to recommend that people out on the street wear masks uh, or the vendors we have, if, if uh, uh, they're looking for PPE and like the IT people, mm -hmm. they're contacting us. Where do you get your stuff? And we're like, well, wait a second. We kind of <laughs> need stuff ourselves. Yeah. So now the demand is is exponential for people trying to get this kind of stuff just to wear out on the street. So mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Um, in terms of evaluating patients to see if they have the virus or have had contact, what is kind of your procedure and are you using any new tools? or looked into anything? Obviously, uh, a history is important. And I think everybody has seen all those types of things on you know, webinars before. So I'm not gonna get into the specifics, but uh, the, obviously taking a patient's temperature appears to be something that will be going on pretty, probably indefinitely. Right. Uh, we're gonna see this more so in other areas, maybe when you go through security at the airport or to a large sporting event or just to the movies, you're probably going to have to have your temperature taken. 
-hmm. So initially we had um, the no touch uh, thermometers, the digital thermometers, mm -hmm. but I was rather surprised when I actually looked at the uh, instructions for these devices. Um, it, in a cold environment like Michigan, um, patient comes in off, off the street, mm -hmm. Right. They have a different ambient temperature. Yeah. And when is it you take their temperature? Is it out in the middle of a snowstorm or rain storm? Yeah. Or once they've already come into your office, that's a dilemma. So right. with those devices, I'm going to read, because I think it's important, the instructions for the device that we had. Mm. It, says, it says it's important to know each individual's normal temperature when they are well by taking multiple readings. <laughs> the only way to accurately diagnose a fever. Well, that's a big problem because we, <laughs> we don't have a baseline for them. Right. Uh, then it says the patient must be inside for 30 minutes before taking a measurement. Okay, so there's 30 minutes of an appointment. The device and the patient should be in the same ambient temperature for 10 minutes and the patient should remove hats and I add hoodies, headbands, headscarves, et cetera, 10 minutes before taking a reading. <laughs> and the parents should not, or the parents, the patient should not drink, eat, or physically be active before or while taking the measurement. I can't imagine chasing the patient around the room <laughs> to get a measurement. But those instructions tell me, along with the lack of accuracy from these devices, which right. Jackie Doris has indicated could be plus or minus two, two degrees. Yeah. That's absolutely useless. Mm -hmm. So the next thing that we considered was the use of disposable thermometers, which are available. Right. However, if you think how many patients you see in a day, multiply that times the, the you'll see in a year, mm -hmm. uh, and how many of those devices you're going to waste and throw away, the cost is unbelievable. Yeah. So what we're looking at now, and I don't have an answer yet, are mm -hmm. We're seeing a huge number of uh, infrared temperature sensors that are mounted on stands, tripods, uh, kiosks. Don't know their accuracy. They are yeah. pricey. But if mm. you consider the cost benefit of having someone have to actually take someone's temperature versus having a kiosk tell you, hey, they got a temperature or not, maybe in the long run, having them come through and just have their temperature read readings on those devices might be more financially viable mm -hmm. uh, com compared to the initial cost of the device. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's that's a lot more complicated than it seems. <laughs> yes. Um, in terms of disinfection procedures, what have you changed or is there anything new you're going to be doing? Uh, there are a lot of different disinfectants that are on the marketplace. Again, uh, Jackie Dorse has talked a lot about those wanting yeah. to uh, you to do your homework on the, the data sheets and uh, properties of the materials and their applications, their safety, et cetera. Um, we found a few others that uh, I found fascinating um, since we know that you see some changes in hospitals or mm -hmm. airlines, uh, other public areas where they're fogging or spraying chemicals. Uh, yeah. So that, that led uh, us to do a little bit of additional research. And uh, one of the most common ones is what is called HOCl or hypochlorous acid, which is basically, a, it can be done uh, with something you buy off of online, off, off like say Amazon, and mm -hmm. do it at home to make your own disinfectant. And it includes uh, the use of a, electrolysis to uh, change salt, water, and vinegar into this light or weak acid. Now, mm -hmm. it's interesting that our white blood cells actually do produce HOCl in our own bodies. Mm -hmm. So the hypochlorous acid uh, is, is non-toxic and uh, it is also, uh, it's not, you're not, so you're not spraying around a, a toxic chemical all the time in your office. Mm -hmm. So it, it, could be, it could be created in office with a special device, like a coffee right. pot type looking thing, or okay. a big device, and then you can use it to wipe down, you can use mm -hmm. it to spray. So that's one of the options. Okay. Another one is uh, there's a proprietary version of an H HOCL product, and that's called uh, Pura Tabs, mm -hmm. and it's from Eva Clean, E V A E V A Clean. Mm -hmm. And that's sodium 
uh, trochloacine, I can never get it right, <laughs> which uh, is a, an EPA registered material. It's a, it comes in a tablet, you put it in a water tank, and that water tank is going to probably be on some type of an electrostatic sprayer. Mm -hmm. And they do make it their own electrostatic sprayer. There are others on the marketplace. Now, what's unique about this with a sprayer in your office is these sprayers will produce a charged liquid uh, droplets or aerosols, and that material will surround whatever you're spraying. So let's say you spray on a tabletop. That will actually spread around because it's charged, looking for the opposite charge, like underneath of the table. Mm -hmm. So if you're spraying, this stuff is going everywhere. So my next question was, is it safe around dental medical equipment? And the answer is supposedly yes, but I'm always a skeptic because if I'm yeah. spraying this around computer equipment, mm. and um, I know that I, you know we purchased uh, uh, washable keyboards and mice, but I don't know about the monitor and the tower. And okay. also, I'm not real thrilled about the idea of spraying this around an iTero scanner or any other scanner, digital scanner. Right. So it would be my intent to bag those things, let's say with a garbage bag that's mm -hmm. tied tight before you're gonna go spray this stuff around, but it can also be wiped down as, as well. Okay. Then there's another that uh, is called vital oxide. Now there, there's other ones besides these two, mm -hmm. but this is a particular disinfectant cleaner, which is oxychlorine ammonium chloride. It's non-corrosive, no skin irritation, also EPA approved for one minute uh, COVID uh, uh, sanitation. Okay. And that is also spread through an electric static sprayer, if you wish. But I would ask that you, anybody, please do your own research before you, you make an investment in any of these particular products. Yeah. Uh, I think Jason's using uh, just uh, hydrogen peroxide sprayed around with a mm -hmm. sprayer, electrostatic sprayer. So mm -hmm. that may be another possibility. And I don't know what the percentage is that he's using. So yeah. Uh, that's that's the, 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 these are different things we're going to attempt. Uh, what have you focused on as part of your preparation for recovery is how your practice can mitigate and handle aerosols in the clinic areas. The AAO COVID-19 task force specifically looking at aerosol mitigation as this is a big issue with the open bay concept in most practices. What have you learned in your research and what do you think orthodontists should be looking at? Okay, I think the first thing we need to mention is that currently there's no actual evidence that the virus is actually being transmitted through aerosol droplets, mm -hmm. at least in the micro aerosol range. But the lack of evidence is not proof either. So yeah. uh, it's you know it's better to be forewarned as forearmed. So um, there are plenty of other air, uh, airborne diseases that uh, we assume are simply handled by our current standard precautions. And yet maybe we need to consider uh, a little more elaborate uh, changes. I mean, I used to practice uh, when I got out of, in, in, of residency at a time when we didn't even wear mat, uh, gloves, let alone mm -hmm. masks. Okay. And uh, it was like, well, I can't bend wire with gloves on. That's incredibly stupid. Uh, and then, then we got masks and shields and we started to hire people to come in for infection control training. And mm -hmm. so we're at a point you go, well, I'm not going to change anything. Well, you know, maybe there are some things we need to at least think about changing. So um, that's where our research in, I use that word loosely, looking mm -hmm. up stuff in a <laughs> lot, uh, led to some changes that we're, we're anticipating in practice. Of course, we're not open yet. Yeah. Uh, certainly, mitigation of aerosols begins in the patient's mouth. Mm -hmm. And we know that there are a number of co uh, commercial devices that we use during e our bonding procedures, uh, used in dentistry that go into the mouth to suction uh, saliva and aerosols, et cetera, uh, and debris from like doing a, a restoration mm -hmm. uh, that are readily available and been used for a long time. So that's a start. Mm -hmm. Most of those are on the low volume evacuation tubing that we use. Okay. The high evalu evacuation, the high volume evacuation tubing is not as commonly used in a routine basis uh, because oftentimes requires two 
to persons, somebody to assist if you're, let's say you're doing uh, polishing of enamel or uh, mm -hmm. adhesives off of teeth with a handpiece. Uh, if you're trying to hold high-speed evacuation at the same time, it gets to be a bit unwieldy. Mm -hmm. So the second thing that's possible is to add some new devices that hook onto high-speed evacuation. And there are a number of them that we, you can find on the internet that at attach to that and may then hook onto your uh, cheek retractor. Mm -hmm. So in case you're, as you're doing a bonding, you would attach this device and it works sort of as a scavenger. It's scavenging up just at the edge of the mouth, things that are coming out. Okay. And with the ones that are attached to the lip retractors, that doesn't require a second person to, uh, to hold that device. You can also simply take some type of funnel, uh, and there are commercial versions of that, uh, that is attached to the uh, HVE that mm -hmm. is held by the patient. Mm -hmm. uh, another option, would be to uh, use some, again, newer devices that are the HVE attachment for a mirror suction combination. So they are a bit pricey, but they it is basically uh, a, 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 a suction through a mirror that has some perforations on the side of it that's hollow. Mm. And that then could be held by the same person that's using handpiece. Okay. okay. And uh, again, there are a variety of models of that available. So uh, the third, I hope I'm on the third one, uh, <laughs> would be um, the use of extra oral uh, suction machines. These kind of look like a little R2D2 unit with some sort of uh, flexible tubing that comes out the top with a funnel at the end, or could be some sort of, uh, looks like a mechanical arm that you adjust mm -hmm. and you're putting these things near the mouth. So if you really wanted to go crazy, you could put an intraoral and a high-speed handpiece or high-speed uh, mirror and then this little uh, uh, scavenger by the mouth and then have mm -hmm. right next to the face this other suction device which can have filtration in it, both HEPA filters and UV. So mm -hmm. now you're probably, with all of those put together, mitigating quite a few aerosols. <laughs> Then right. add one more thing, you have your shield and face mask on, and then there are no, another group of devices that are on the market now that are plastic shields that go between you and the patient. They can be swung over, attached okay. to your light, or they can also be in the form of a box that the patient's head is enclosed, which <laughs> seems a little claustrophobic, uh -huh. but uh, these are, uh, some of them are even being developed here in Kalamazoo at Western Michigan University, and they're used for intubation for anesthesiologists. Right. So yeah. with a little modification, now you've got all of this stuff going on. So you're gonna get to pick and choose what you feel is the best, because mm -hmm. remember all the plastic in front of your face is gonna distort what you're seeing. So some of it may be uh, your, your ability to, to work two-handed uh, or ability to see, mm -hmm. uh, in trying to mitigate these aerosols in the immediate area of the patient. Yeah. That's a long-winded answer, but. <laughs> well, what direction do you think you're going for your practice? Well, I think, I think I've sort of been put into a position from Jackie and her commenting <laughs> on what we've been doing into, uh, let me try them all. <laughs> so we actually have on order just about every one of those things. Oh, okay. To give it a try. Okay. Um, so I don't I don't know. J Jason Cope and I are both trying different things, and we'll mm -hmm. see what see what works best. He's already in practice. I've got a few more weeks to to right. play around with these things. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know which direction. Okay. I, I haven't tried any of these yet on a real person. So okay. we'll see. Okay. So maybe we'll check back with you in a couple couple months. Yes. <laughs> One of the things you're looking at is the fact that your main practice is the building itself is over 20 years old. Um, what are you changing in terms of your HVAC? Or actually, let's start with what was your HVAC situation before COVID-19? All right. You made me sound really old. And <laughs> <laughs> this, this office is 20 years old. It's hard for me to imagine because I still think of it as, as new. Um, uh, I had actually drawn the plans for this office. so. Um, you know, I, I still 
am thrilled with where I am and how it yeah. was designed, but we are making some changes. Mm -hmm. I should probably go back and say, you were asking about what happened when we first shut down and this first occurred. Oh, yeah. So I started to purchase equipment and start to make changes and plans. And then there was a conversation with Jackie Dorst. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd heard seminars from her and Andrea Cook and Marie Fluent. And we have continued to watch and listen to their advice. And so one of the things that Jackie said that was intriguing to me was uh, check with your heating, air conditioning, ventilation person, the company that you work with. Mm -hmm. Well, we had uh, been told, I want to say at least a year or two ago, that we needed to change our furnace. We have three of them in the building. Okay. And um, they're, everything is original equipment, has lasted us quite nicely. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, oh, and she said, you need to have an HVAC engineer come in and, and give you advice about the equipment that you're anticipating on purchasing mm -hmm. and what do you have currently. And also bring in, I was bringing in my dental equipment folks mm -hmm. uh, for, for this, the other project we're going to discuss. Right. And um, so we go downstairs and look at the equipment and start to discuss what we're going to do as far as replacing our furnace since we're not seeing any patients, uh, maintaining social distancing, of course, mm -hmm. and masks. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, well, why don't you add in a HEPA filter and a UV light filter to your furnaces? Like, wow, that that might be a really good good thing to do rather than having a bunch of little units uh, plugged in in my main clinic area, which is an open bay. That might be uh, one of our partial solutions. Right. Luckily, the person that handles our HVAC equipment is an engineer and he wow. lectures on this material and he had a plan. And mm -hmm. uh, one of them was this replacement of the furnace with the filtration equipment. And while we're in the basement with our dental equipment people, uh, we looked at the um, the HVE, our evacuation equipment. Mm -hmm. Where do all those dental units, where do they go? Well, they come to the basement into the pump. And those can be dry pumps or water pumps. Mine's an old water pump. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so what it does is it suctions all of that stuff out of a patient's mouth and then brings it down. And there's a separator which separates out the effluent to, in our case, to the, the sewage system. And um, then the air that's left over is separated out. And that certainly has aerosols in it of all mm -hmm. the stuff you suctioned up. Right. It exits the pump or the, 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 the uh, separation unit. And in, our, in my case, it exits right below the clinic floor <laughs> and oh. thankfully we saw this because <laughs> obviously when the office was created perhaps the uh the construction requirements did not include where this was supposed to go oh. so in effect whatever we're pumping out of a patient's mouth and around it is going right back up under our clinic floor. It's kind of like having a the exhaust from a car leaking carbon monoxide back in through the floorboards. Right, yeah. Killing you slowly. <laughs> so all this stuff we were doing and planning is absolutely worthless if you don't know if your own vacuum equipment is, is it exiting, exhausting outside? or back into your utility room or your basement. So that was the most important um, finding that we've had in all that we've done. So that that was a shocker. <laughs> Definitely. Well, yeah. so what physical changes are you making right now to the office? Okay. So part of the reason I brought in this, this uh, expert mm -hmm. was to consider the possibility of just simply closing off one room for aerosol procedures, aerosol generating procedures. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there, there had been some discussions of this. I believe that even the uh, state of Pennsylvania <clears throat> attempted to mandate a negative pressure rooms. Mm -hmm. And the words negative pressure, I mean, that, that just is like a knife through the soul of a dentist because of the costs involved in, in the change in engineering, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So luckily I had, two rooms that were, we were using for records. So it used to be impressions, now it's scanning. And uh, I decided, well, 
with a door on this room and no windows, what would it take for us to uh, clear the aerosols in that room? Because the square footage is not that big. And that's one of the concerns you have with an open bay is the square footage to cover and filter is huge. Right. So assuming that there might be some concerns with aerosols carrying this virus or others, he said, oh, well, we do negative pressure rooms. And, you know, I know that's not mandated, but what if we could give you an option where it, with a flip of a switch, it becomes a negative pressure room and exhausts everything that you've filtered. There's going to be a filter system, both mm -hmm. HEPA and UV in that room. And you just exit it exhausted outdoors. Mm -hmm. And now there's that vacuum is pulling the air into the room and not letting it escape. Well, negative pressure is nothing more than your family bathroom that has a fan in it, oh, okay. is producing eight changes per hour in a typical household bathroom, mm -hmm. okay? So uh, CDC in a uh, aerosol generating procedure, and again, you're gonna need to look these things up because these, these types of things change all the time, the regulations, um, is six changes per hour. Okay. And uh, this room can go up to 14 changes per hour, which is like hospital level. So it's like, wow. So if I bought all of this other gear that we're talking about, and I already had, <laughs> would that equate to this permanent change for a room that would, in effect, take care of potentially future mandates, mm -hmm. or at least make everybody feel safer, especially yeah. the dental hygienist who's going to be working in that environment primarily and removing braces. Mm. So... It, it turns out that cost effectiveness, it probably is better for us to do that. Okay. So I know that many just are apoplectic when they hear that, you know, we might have a negative pressure room in our mm -hmm. practice, but it also doesn't make economic sense to leave it as an air, a negative pressure room unless it's required, because you have to remember anything you're exiting as far as air outside this office you're paying for conditioning that air ahead of time, either air conditioning or heating it. So okay. you're just blowing dollars out the wall. So it's only when it would be necessary, you simply have duct work for filtering that room that goes out of the okay. office. So it's filtered air coming in under a door. Mm -hmm. It's being filtered within that environment. Uh, so uh, you also have to remember, if you simply change your HEPA, add filtration to your regular HVAC system, uh, that you have to leave the fan on during the day. So if you mm -hmm. have an auto setting, that fan goes off right. when it reaches a specific temperature. Therefore, you have no more filtration. Oh, okay. So that's another thing I had not realized is it sounds great to have that uh, filter on our heating air conditioning, mm -hmm. but it's not working unless there's a fan pulling that air around okay. and it would be the same thing with the, the, the private room. So mm -hmm. it has to be turned on and regulated. So the amount of air exiting is, is up to you how much you want of a negative pressure. So it's not as complex as what we might think to at right. least come up this to this level. But it's mm -hmm. not for everyone. And I'm not telling everybody to do this. You may not have a room to do that in. It mm -hmm. may just be impossible. Yeah. So now we're back with what are you going to do in an open bay? Mm. Yeah, exactly. Okay. As you have looked at this, um, the professionals you've been talking to, have they had experience working with orthodontic offices before? Uh, the the person that's doing our HVAC equipment? Yeah. No, but he's worked in other medical facilities and they're installing similar things. Uh, so uh, he came up with a, a way to, to make this happen for specifically what we had. He designed it exactly for this to mm -hmm. make it, in effect, economically feasible mm -hmm. without adding walls or tearing down stuff or doing major, major things. I mean, yeah. there is obviously some some construction work that's going to be required to put put this. The, the filter goes under our uh, above the ceiling. Mm -hmm. and, and there's there's obviously ducting that's going to go. Uh, right. with a blower that will take that air and then run it outside or mm -hmm. back into the room if you decide to recirculate that. 
Okay. So that's a, that's another concern for folks that are buying units to put in within their clinic just to purify mm -hmm. air uh, right. within the clinic. Is certainly there are filters on many of them, but where mm -hmm. does that air exhaust? Right. It just comes out the back of the, the unit, mm -hmm. or you can set it up to go outside. Mm -hmm. You could tie in. I don't know. It sound it would probably sound like a helicopter hovering in your office with all these units tied together to cover all the square footage you would need and then yeah. you have to all these holes in your walls somewhere <laughs> in order to get the stuff out mm -hmm. so you just have to keep those things in mind that's why my recommendation is the same as jackie's mm -hmm. just bring somebody in and have them take a look what what's best for you mm -hmm. and uh none of this so far has been exactly mandated right you got to do what you think is best for yourself and your patients and your mm -hmm. staff yeah definitely um when you were um looking at HVAC, <clears throat> sorry, when you were looking at HVAC professionals to talk to, um, what kind of previous experience were you looking at? Because you did say that the one you worked with had at least worked with um, some medical offices before, but what would your advice be to orthodontists who are looking to consult with an HVAC ex expert and haven't before? Yeah, I got lucky because I had no idea that this guy knew knew this stuff. We, that's yeah. not, that wasn't our first conversation about it, it was the intent was to talk about the furnace equipment and what about these other units that I bought? Can you tell me if they're what I should do with them, et cetera? Right. It wasn't. It was then when he came up with this plan that I said, "Well, that's interesting." Now, how would I tell somebody else to go find somebody that knows what you know? Because he mm -hmm. he has he has lectured on this material, uh, yeah. and, and and so. He said 95% of HVAC folks probably do not know anything about any of this. Okay. That's typically your guy that comes in to repair your heater or air conditioner. Yeah. Okay. So you need to ask him some questions. Mm -hmm. do you, have you had any experience with this kind of situation? Or do you know anything about negative pressure rooms or the creation or engineering of systems uh, and HEPA filtration and UV systems? You want to know if they know something about it. Mm -hmm. And then I said, "Is there are there any certifications you could look for?" Mm -hmm. Well, certainly ASHRAE, that's A S H R A E, is one of the main organizations, and they have a lot of recommendations. And uh, there's a lot of stuff online you can look at for different designs of what you might want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's also the companies themselves that make these devices may have plans that are uh, have been employed in other locations. But there are other memberships like ACCA, which is the Air Conditioning Contractor Association, mm -hmm. uh, the NCI National Comfort Institute, I like that one, um, BPI, uh, ResNet. So there's all kinds of these organi organizations. Ask them what, their, what are their qualifications and mm -hmm. what experience have they had? Do you have any um, referral sources, anybody that recommendations mm -hmm. that could say, yeah, they know what they're doing? So um, I think very quickly, if you ask a couple of questions about the things we've talked about, if they aren't quite sure, it's time to look for somebody else. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think this information will be really helpful to our audience. So Jay, thank you for joining me today. I really you appreciate bet. it. Great. Thank you. And to our viewers, thank you for watching. Remember to check out orthodonticproductsonline.com for the latest orthodontic industry news. <laughs> Until next time, take care and stay safe. <laughs> Absolutely.